Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with WIPV TV and Indiana Public Radio at Ball State University. Today we are chatting with Jim Williams, board president of Muncie Community Schools. Jim has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. Thank you, Jim, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So there is nothing more important to community, to a region, than an educated uh, po uh, population, people who are prepared for work, uh, people who joyously are prepared to learn throughout their careers. Talk about the importance of Muncie Community Schools and talk about the situation that you find yourself in today. Muncie um, has a long and very gloried history when it comes to its school system. Um, we have been blessed with a great deal of philanthropic spirit in the community, um, good corporate partners, vibrant nonprofit sector, active and well-led foundations. It became clear to me when I was serving as a trial judge in the early part of uh, this century that uh, communities like Muncie in the post-industrial era were going to struggle, uh, particularly as we saw uh, tax reform in Indiana and property tax caps and funding um, that was going to be uh, stabilizing at a minimum and decreasing in all likelihood as we saw some population uh, changes, demographic changes. So uh, you had at one point, uh, I think at its peak, uh, a student body of 10 to 11,000 in Muncie Community Schools. That has now shrunk to 6,000. And shrinking is difficult. It's a 40% contraction of, of the student base. And meanwhile, your economic base is also contracting. And, and your tax base is also contracting for a number of different reasons. So it's a, it's a perfect storm Correct. Of, of difficulty. And meanwhile, you have, a, you have an edifice that is there set up to, to serve 10,000 students. And that's absolutely correct. You have a capital base that's set up to serve 10 to 11,000 students, an employee base that's set up for that, and it shrinks and difficult decisions uh, were uh, put off frankly, for too long. Which creates additional stress on the system, right? And, and then you end up having outliers of, of, of uh, service that can no longer be supported but are, but are being funded, and you have parents who are becoming more and more distressed about the conditions of the school, which creates its own set of, of problems that have to be dealt with. Absolutely, and so that comes to a head, and the state intervenes in January of, of uh, 18, and we have the legislation that partners up all state with uh, Muncie Community Schools. And I believe quite candidly that the state looks at this as a form of a pilot uh, for other communities potentially moving forward in terms of uh, reducing statutory and regulatory uh, burdens on the system and introducing uh, partnerships that can most efficiently and collaboratively uh, aid the school system. And when we're thinking about schooling, um, the notion that a school system can and should be a primary focus of a community's economic development life, I don't believe that we've ever uh, been very purposeful in approaching it in that fashion. In Indiana, we have traditionally thought of the school as a center of the community, a center of its social life. Uh, in Indiana, particularly basketball on Friday nights and Saturday right. nights. Um, and the old saying goes, when consolidation occurred in the late 50s and early 60s, that when a school uh, shuttered in a community, the community died. And th there's some truth to that. And as we move forward into 2018 and 2019, uh, if your school is not going to function as a primary mover in the life of that community's economic development, uh, that community is going to have an end which is not pleasant, and it's going to be a slow and painful um, atrophy uh, of towns like Muncie, Kokomo, Richmond, um, others that are similarly situated, uh, and you can go throughout the Midwest. When people ask me where does Muncie uh, sit compared to other similarly situated towns across the Midwest, I say, you know, we have all of the same set of problems. Muncie's school system, if you look at the metrics, uh, is not an outlier. We came to a financial head maybe sooner than some of the others, right. but 
in terms of academic performance and the makeup of the student body, we're very similar to all those towns I just mentioned. What Muncie has uh, that a lot of those communities don't and that is a vibrant um, set of players and actors who are able to act as very strategic assets in the life of the continuing life of the school system. So bringing those parties together, the university, Ivy Tech, Purdue Polytech, Vincennes, uh, your nonprofit sector, it's your foundation. It's your strengths and creating out of, the, out of the strong players that you have, the strong sense of community, the institutions that you have, as you say, the philanthropic institutions, the educational right. institutions like Ball State, and creating out of those strengths solutions. A absolutely. And the communities that are actively uh, sounding that clarion call to action, and there's, there's many around the United States, are seeing some success. Now, it's like turning a battleship. Yes. And there are, there, there's a lot of room for efficiencies to be realized. And there's going to be hard decisions in that process. There are also a lot of interests that, that need to be considered. You have people who have earned their livelihoods over the last years from providing education for a diminishing student body. Absolutely. There are going to be parents who have particular interests and particular ideas. There are going to be experts who come in and, and may be from outside of the community, but they might also have a valid point of view of how to solve this. The business community will have a say. So you have all these different voices. How do you approach these voices in a way that ensures that they're all heard even if they are not all satisfied with a solution because you can't, when you have different opinions, to the extent that you completely satisfy one player, you're going to completely dissatisfy another. So how do you navigate that very complex landscape and end up with something that is better for the children? Because really what this is about is about helping the children. Yeah, as, as Edward Albee said in his 1960s play, it's a delicate balance. However, I think with the, the board we have in place and in conjunction with the partnership with Ball State and the legislature, what we have articulated is that every decision should be guided uh, by the, the notion of what is in the best interest of the children who are attending MCS and going to be attending MCS. And if you frame your decision that way, I'm not saying it's easy, but if you frame it in that, in that fashion, and you are able to uh, get people to look at evidence-based, data-driven decision-making, um, th th those answers will, if not become perfectly clear, I think Colin Powell said, if you have 80% of the information necessary to make a decision, that's really a pretty good metric. That is a pretty good metric. And so- Pretty, pretty smart guy, too. Yeah, absolutely. So if you can get to that point where you have uh, a significant amount of information that drives your decision, uh, for the benefit of the best interest of the children. Uh, that's got to be the decision, regardless of uh, those stakeholders who may not feel uh, that they're being fairly taken care of. And it's not about taking care of stakeholders, it's about taking care of those kids in the community. You have taken on, as the chair of the board, this incredible responsibility and your fellow board members. What motivates you all to step into this battlefield? I can speak for myself um, and my background um, now practicing law for 30 years and serving a stint as a trial judge uh, with general jurisdiction and senior judge in the state of Indiana. Uh, I had juvenile jurisdiction, uh, both children in need of services or CHINs as it's popularly known and right. um, children who've allegedly committed crimes. And when you see uh, those kids and families, and also in domestic cases, you understand, I think, pretty quickly that what it takes for some people to get simply get from dawn to dusk is really a, a great challenge. Full and of stress. Full of stress, full of trauma. And the foundation that a thorough education gives to an individual in order to weather the storms of life is irreplaceable. Otherwise, you, you relegate these children into these transgenerational cycles you, of you, repeating this, this trauma, repeating these, these lives which, which can be changed. 
Yeah, absolutely. And when I grew up in the early 70s in southeastern Indiana, you could leave my high school at 15, 16, 17 years old and probably find a job in one of the foundries in southwest Ohio, southeast Indiana, and make a reasonably decent economic life for yourself. Um, that's not the case right now. I mean, and it's not going to be the case ever again. So if you look at the moral imperative of making certain that we give our kids the best opportunity possible to have hopeful lives, uh, that's one issue. The second issue is not mercenary, but it's certainly not altruistic either, uh, and that is we have an economic development need for capable employees. We have a 3.89% unemployment rate right now. Uh, my law firm is struggling to fill a couple of positions. It's a knowledge economy. Absolutely. So when you're looking at um, these young people and young adults, middle age adults, and trying to fit them into this economy, uh, that's to all of our collective benefit. And if we understand that the alternative is ultimately one of chaos and disruption and heavy expense in terms of social services, prisons, law enforcement, um, the Department of Family and Children. Um, we need to understand that our investment and our contribution gets its best return by far. Our, our best return on investment is on education and particularly the younger, the better. Uh, I'm an advocate uh, for universal pre-K in part because we need to have children into an environment uh, where their brains are developing uh, at the pace they're supposed to. 90% um, of your brain development occurs between birth and five, 90%. So if you get a five-year-old coming to kindergarten and that five-year-old has been subjected to uh, a level of neglect or abuse or trauma or simply poverty, which by its nature is a form of trauma, uh, you're getting a five-year-old child in the door in kindergarten and you can pour money at that until you're blue in the face. You are not going to recover those losses. Jim Williams, thank you so much for sharing the story of Muncie Community Schools, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you for having me.